all you cool cats and kittens. It's Carol Baskin from Big Cat Rescue and I just came all the way down the front of Vacation Rotation. Don't see a single tiger. Came down Serval Row. Don't see a single serval. So I'm going to try something different and go behind the cages and see if maybe we'll see some cats that way. I apologize that this is so shaky. I have been screwing around for the last 10 minutes trying to find my stabilizer. I know I had it yesterday when I went live. It seems like I did some kind of filming later on after that and had it. It's not on my bike, not in my office. So I'm not sure where it is. And this may be just totally too shaky for you guys to watch. And if so, I am so sorry. The way our cages are built here is uh, kind of a unique formation that my father came up with. And because these cage panels were at a max 20 feet across, all of our cages are built in these kind of snake-shaped designs <laughs> um, so that there could be a, if you can see like right here where this curved thing is, going across the top of the cage, those braces are what keep the roofs flat and straight. And so even though our cats have a lot of space, these cages back here are 1,800 square feet each and our smallest ones are 1,200 square feet each. If you're on the tour path, you just <laughs> you don't see any cats. <laughs> because they could be anywhere in their cage. And it's not that there's so much hiding from people as they can just be wherever they want. And so if this is the better view, which I would agree, this is a much better view, then maybe the cats will be back on this side of the cages or their cages. But so far that was Zukari and I didn't see him. Next up is Nala. And as it gets hotter, they do spend more time inside their dens. Somebody did a nice job of mowing back here. Where is Nala? Nala Serval. have to look under the coolaroos too because they like to do that. Okay. Well, we're zero for two. When these were built, they were all built for tigers. That's why they have these huge pools, but servals like to play in the water, so we thought they might like them. I don't see them using them a whole lot. Ah, oh, a serval. Is it Hutch serval? I think it might be. Hi. Finally, a serval. Hey, Audra and Deb. Yeah, this is cat nap time of the day. <laughs> Are you going to agree with a big old yawn? Oh man, I am yawning. Hi. Well, you are so sweet. Yes, you are. You're such a very good cat. Did I wake you up? Were you snoozing? Why does this not have an appear on top option anymore? I don't know what you're asking. Appear on top of what? Is that some new Facebook thing? Cause like every week is a new Facebook thing. 
Oh man, we're so sleepy. Well, thank you for coming over here and sitting with us. This is so nice of you. It's very nice of you. People just trying to get their cat fixed today. Oh goodness, are we so wobbly? What is that? Nancy, we got a tiny, tiny bit of rain. Just enough to say it did. Not really enough to do much good. Barbara, you are quite welcome. I really appreciate the fact that this cat's going to lay here for us. Far enough away that I don't have to worry about getting whacked. Maybe. <laughs> you going to keep me on my toes? So you guys know that if there's one superpower that I claim to have, it's that I can see the future. And I think it's pretty funny that neuroscientists right now are saying that's something we all do. We all predict the future. And I was listening to a great podcast. I love this. It's from Singularity University, and it's called The Feedback Loop. And the one I'm listening to right now is their most recent one. And I forget who the scientist is that they're talking to, but they're talking about the fact that neuroscientists are saying now that the brain is not a machine that evaluates what your senses feed into it, but rather is predicting what you will experience from your senses. And so through, and this kind of reminds me of like, Einstein's spooky science, you know, that when you start looking at things at the microscopic level and how fast a signal is transferred from your eye to your brain, the fact of the matter is that you're reacting to that image before it even gets to your brain. And a perfect example of that is like if something goes flying at your eye, like a bug or something, your eye is shut before that signal ever even gets there. And I just think that's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And I love hearing about what science is finding as far as how humans um, interact with their environment, how all of us are interconnected in so many, so many ways. And so it got me to thinking, this is like really powerful stuff if you think about it. My grandmother raised me on books like The Power of Positive Thinking and Think and Grow Rich and Psycho-Cybernetics and all of those amazing books. And if you guys have been raised on books or, you know, in your adult lives, read these uh, amazing books that have helped you think about how to have positive thoughts and create a positive experience in your life, then please put them in the comments because I want to go back afterwards and see if there's any good ones that you guys can recommend. Because I really believe in the power of positive thinking. I think that what we're finding in neuroscience now is that we are creating the universe that we are thinking about. And that is so important because each and every one of us has the ability to create and to bring about a universal transformation based on thinking positively. And I'm just, I'm fascinated by it. And so anything that you guys can share that has helped you in that way, I, I would certainly, certainly appreciate that feedback. Are you feeling positive thoughts? It kind of explains how, sometimes I wonder, how can two people look at the same thing and see something totally different or feel something totally different about it? 
And I think a big part of that is where you're coming from in the first place. That if you're coming from a sense of everything is working out exactly as it's supposed to and things always turn out the way they should and um, all of those positive types of a mindset, then when you see something, you automatically see all of the good that can come from that. And by embracing all of that good, you are in a, a happy state of mind, but you're also bringing about a much happier environment for everybody, for your family, for your pets, for the people that you work with, all of it depending on how it is that you're perceiving it based on what your life experience has been. And if you're seeing that from a negative perspective, then it, it colors it in a way that makes it painful for you and painful for everyone around you. And so it's our choice. We get to make the choice of how we think or how we believe about anything that happens. And I think the first step to that is just anything that happens, recognizing it for it just being that thing. It's not anything more than that than the, the weight that we give it the way that we interpret it. He just looks so peaceful there. Yeah. I hate to leave here because I don't know if we'll see any other servals, but we'll try. So much for my morning philosophy. I ride my bike five miles a day to the sanctuary five miles back gives me a lot of time to listening to podcasts. I don't listen to music. I like to listen to podcasts about science and virtual reality and augmented reality and artificial intelligence. This morning, one of the first emails that I got was from Google saying that they are putting people on a wait list. You have to apply to be on this wait list. Oh, this is still his cage. Um, for something called BARD, B-A-R-D. And it's artificial intelligence for nonprofits. So I'm really excited to get on that list and find out what they're going to be able to do with artificial intelligence for nonprofits. Some of the things that they mentioned in there was help with fundraising, um, help with like writing a newsletter, and um, volunteer management. So it sounds like there's some really cool things that Google's been working on behind the scenes and in, in artificial intelligence as well. Oh, I don't see Des. We'll go all the way around and maybe we'll see the cats on the other side. This is Alethea's cage. And Alethea's not under her Kularu. I can see under it and she's not there. There's the sandhill cranes out in the field. Wonder if she's, oh, there she is. So she's under this platform back here. And she's got all those trees over there that she could be under, but no. <laughs> she comes out here and gets under her Kularu or under her platform. I don't know if I can get this zoomed in enough that you guys can see her. My screen is blacked out, so I can't tell what I'm looking at here. Get down a little bit lower. All right, there's some serval ears. At least a silhouette of a serval. Yeah, hello there, Lethia. Oh, goodness gracious. These sandhill cranes are pretty cool. They come here all the time. Sometimes they have a baby. Right now they don't. 
Or if they do, they haven't brought them out in the open yet. They're the birds I always refer to as the pterodactyls because they make a really prehistoric sound when they're calling to each other. If I'm in my car or even on my bike, I can get right up close to them. But if I try to walk up on them, they're not having any part of that. All right, here's another shot that we might be able to see of Aletheia under there. That's a little bit better. She's like, look at the ear flashes. Talk to the ear flashes. I know, I'm not gone yet. Despite being totally ignored. Need to get a better screen protector for my phone because man when it's bright outside I cannot see the screen at all and I'd really like to be talking to you guys and responding to you. <laughs> Cheryl says nice view. I can see that because I just stepped into the trees. Hey Trisha and Michelle. Um, I see in the comments here some people are asking whether or not we're going to reopen for tours, and no, we um, we lost our infrastructure during COVID-19. So when COVID-19 hit, the keepers kept coming in to take care of the cats, but because we weren't open to the public for obvious reasons, then all of the people that were on our admin volunteer group that did the tours stopped coming and they found other things to do with their lives so we only have one tour guide now whereas used to everybody did tours and nobody wanted to do tours but um, we had a group of people who were willing to do tours because they weren't able to do animal care things and those people just aren't here anymore so there's just been no way for us to reopen I'm looking for Dev's serval right now. And like I said, when I first came out this morning, if you play this back from the beginning, I went all up and down the road here and you couldn't see a single cat. And that's not going to be a good experience for somebody coming out for a tour. We've told our donors of $500 or more that we'll still give them a tour, but they're going to be out here for an hour on a golf cart and probably not see anything. So we have worked out a deal with Scott and Tanya at Turpentine Creek where any of our donors over $500 can visit the cats there when they get there. The tigers hopefully will be going in July and the rest of our cats by October. When I say hopefully, I'm really wanting everybody there before it gets cold so that they have a chance to adjust. They'll have heated dens. Hi, Des. They'll have heated dens and for the cats like servals, they even have like little heated buildings as well. But still, if you're gonna go outside and have fun outside, I want them to have the kind of coat that they need to be able to do that. So we're really hoping that the tigers can move in July and the rest of the cats by October. And what I was saying earlier is that Scott and Tanya are happy to give private, well, not private tours, um, they're happy to give tours to the donors of $500 or more, and they have been open mostly <laughs> since COVID because their way of visiting the cats keeps people further away from them and on a tram than the way our tours were arranged. We had to keep people very close together, and so they still have the tram tours there every day, and it gives you much more opportunity to see their many lions and tigers and ligers and our cats when they get there.
Uh, somebody asked about evening meds and snacks. Yeah, I do that whenever I can catch the people doing evening meds and snacks. And when we had twice as many cats, there were a lot more cats that needed to get evening meds and snacks. Now it's really easy for me to miss the whole thing because there's only a few cats on that route. I do enjoy following the evening keepers when they do that kind of work though, because it's a time that we actually get to see some cats, which you would not see otherwise. And yet, you know, for the purpose of doing tours, we really can't do tours then or during feeding because we need to make sure that the cats take their meds and eat their food and sometimes they don't do that in the presence of people so we want to keep that as comfortable for them as possible. Oh, we're back here with Hutch so we've already seen him. I think he must have his cages and Ginger's cages right now because she is on Funcation. Funcation is a 22,000 square foot space and most of our bobcats, I think about, at least half, maybe most of our bobcats now have tunnels that will take them to and from Funcation, but the servals are way over here on the other side of the property. So we have to actually catch them and move them <laughs> to take them over there. But she was really easy to move this last time. Once they figured out that every time you go in a crate, it's not because the vet is here to see you. <laughs> Sometimes it's something fun, like funcation. Getting different sights and sounds and smells. These cats are so smart and they're just bored out of their minds in captivity. So we're always looking for ways to give them new sensations. Well, I don't know where our Zoomy friend Zukari is. He has been quite the clown here the last few months because of the cooler weather. It's 83 degrees right now, which is really cool weather for us. Man, I do not see him anywhere. I wonder if he's under there. Well, no, he couldn't be under there. Hmm. Invisicat. Here comes a keeper, Aaron. Ali is either in her den there or out in the other open air enclosure. We'll go see. How was your morning so far? I saw the bucket over there. I was wondering what happened to the keeper. <laughs> I had to take a break because someone dropped off something at the front gate, so I went up and picked up. Was that that big truck? No, that was a meat delivery. Oh, man. Yeah, the three of us powered out 27 80 pound cases of red. It was me, Lisa, and Emma. Oh, my cat knows. <laughs> great start to the day. I'm feeling great. I can take on anything. Well, there you have it. We were just talking about attitude. And man, what a difference a good attitude makes. It could have been like, oh gosh, there were only three of us and we had to do all that work. And instead it was like, yes, we did it. We're amazing. I love that. Okay, well, Kali must be sleeping in her den back there. Huh. I see Max in his pool and I know if I go over there, 
he's going to be like, oh, leave me alone. So I'm going to park back here and see if I can just zoom up there so that I'm not annoying him. Hang on a second. I'll study this. Sorry about that. That's Max Tiger, just soaking in his pool. He's one of the tigers from the Guatemala Circus rescue that we did a while back. Yesterday, he was having a very bad day. We had about a dozen people here for a work group that were working way over there. I mean, like on the other side of that catwalk and the other side of Duchess's cage. So couldn't even see them, but there were people there and some of them were male and he just doesn't like men so much. And poor Matt Rusick, he loves these cats and has been coming in to take care of these cats for like 20 years. And yet so many of these circus cats especially had been abused by men in the circus. And so they just see any man as a threat. Well, that just said I could ask a new poll. I don't even know how to do a poll while I'm doing a video, but apparently I touched something on my screen. Well, I was wrong. That was not Max. <laughs> that was Aria. And she likes people. I was so far back, I didn't know who you were. Oh, there for a minute. I thought you were going to play with your toy. I guess I should have known from which pool it was that it was her. She has three pools and he has three pools. <laughs> I saw your stripes. I saw them. What are you doing? You walking off the wetness? trying to decide if she was going to go into that last cage or stay here before I went in the gate because this thing's in my way and I can't get around the other side if she does. And of course, <laughs> oh, cats. Cats will be cats. All right, well, we can wait here a minute and see if she comes back. Jill Kramer, sorry you missed the beginning. Um, it'll be online for 30 days if you want to go back and play it. We were talking about how the brain is a predictive machine and how we see the world through what we expect to see. If we expect some hardship or things to be bad, they're going to be bad. And if we expect them to be great, they're going to be great. And that neuroscience is actually you guys having fun? Neuroscience is proving that to be true. Yeah, I'm filming you, squirrel. You think if you're
you're very still, nobody will see you. Could be right. <laughs> We talked about the reasons why Big Cat Rescue is still closed and will remain closed to the public. But how you can see all of the cats at Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And once our cats get there, you'll be able to see our cats there too. Hey Simba, you coming over? Sometimes I'm so startled by the ages. I was here with a couple of people who were evaluating how much it would cost to move some of the mobile homes here to different locations. We use mobile home rentals to fund the sanctuary. And as this property is sold, they won't need the mobile homes here. And so the father was asking the son, or he was actually asking me how old Simba Tiger was. And I'm trying to remember how old was he when we rescued him several years ago and add in how many years since then. And the kid just looked at the sign that said he was born in 2010. <laughs> he said he's 13. And I'm like thinking to myself, oh my catness, he's 13 years old. <laughs> How'd you get to be so old? Yeah, you're so old, Simba. They were so young when they arrived. I tend to remember the ages of the cats based on when, how old they were when they arrived. And then from there, they just kind of stay forever that same age. So here I thought he was coming to see me, but I guess he's coming to see Aria. Were you coming to see Aria? Or just to stand in front of your camera? You'll see that white thing hanging on the black pole right in front of him. Whoever is watching on his Fricata camera is getting a beautiful shot of him. There's no cage wire in the way. You can see all of our live webcams at bigcatcams.com. Are you going to go see what Erin's up to? What is she doing? What is she doing? And Erin is out here cleaning cages because we don't have enough volunteers showing up anymore to do that, which is sad. For years, we were able to proudly tell our donors that all of their donations actually went to protecting big cats because our tour revenue was able to generate the money for the few salaries that we had and all of the tours, which generated a million dollars a year that we don't have now, those were uh, carried out by volunteers. So it funded all of the expenses of the sanctuary, which made it possible for 100% of people's donations to go to the work at the sanctuary. Our actual mission of taking care of these cats and saving cats from extinction in the wild and ending the trade in them as pets and props and parts so now, I'm not sure. We have a lot of other ways that we bring in money, like I was just talking about. The real estate brings in money for the cats. That's considered an earned income. We have to pay tax on that. But it makes it possible for the donations to go farther. That noise she's making is called chuffing. That's tiger talk for hello. How are you? Where'd he go? Yeah, there he goes. Well. I know, aren't chuffs just the sweetest sound, Deb? I love that. And Suzanne Mesna, she knows a good shuffle when she hears it because she hears a lot of it <laughs> as a webcam operator. Always getting you guys the best clips from those live webcams and posting them at our YouTube channel, bigcatrescue.org. Or, I'm sorry, youtube.com slash bigcatrescue. Well, thank you for watching, Kelly.
Yes, Leslie, those yellow donuts will always and forever remind us of Cameron the Lion. Yeah, nobody loved a donut like that boy. I saw a little bit of a conversation here. Somebody was asking about visiting cats. Where is a good place to go? One of the things I liked about the tour that I took at Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge is at the end of it, they offer people a little single sheet that they can take with them. And it's called something like a um, sanctuary checklist. And so it asks important questions like, are there babies? If there's babies, it's probably a bad place. Um, because no legitimate sanctuary ever breeds babies. And the people who abuse the big cats mm -hmm. usually don't give up babies until they're too big to use. So there might be youngsters at a sanctuary, a legit sanctuary, but there's not going to be babies for the most part. Um, are they allowing people to touch them? No good place, no legitimate sanctuary would ever allow people to touch the wild animals there. And a whole list of things that you could check off to know whether or not you were visiting a good place or a bad place and visiting the bad places is what causes the abuse so please just don't do it there's plenty of accredited sanctuaries you can find all of the good ones at sanctuaryfederation.org and sometimes you just gotta stop and talk to the tigers because it would be rude not to <laughs> And she's off again. We can uh, go see if there are any bobcats about. Oh, you know what I did yesterday? I did um, Singing Sunday with Lisa. And we used the dump truck golf cart and I wonder sometimes I take the phone out of the holder and then I put the golf the stabilizer into the glove compartment so I'm gonna head over there Max is having a much more peaceful day today just snoozing in his den Jasmine's not over here because she's on vacation rotation We'll check and see if Cyrus Caracol is out while we're headed past here. All right, tell me if you spot him. No pun intended there for his spotted little belly. Spotting his cage sign does not count. No, I do not see him. When I first came in this morning, I whipped my phone out of its holder on my bike because I thought Duchess was going to go swimming. She went right down the bank there toward the water. But by the time I got in position, she decided, nah, maybe not. See her? Oh, yes, I do. There's a little paw sticking out of her den. Okay. Please excuse my brief trip over here to see if I left my stabilizer on the dump truck golf cart. <laughs> the dump truck golf cart is not here. 
I had told Victor that it was acting up. And so they were going to have the golf cart company come and service it. There's Victor. We can go ask him what happened to it. He's like, oh no, camera on me. Yesterday, I misplaced my... Yes, 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 yes. That's what I misplaced. And then I couldn't find the golf cart. And I'm like, oh no, they already took it in to be fixed. <laughs> That's what I do. Thank you for fixing that or trying. Oh. It was... Uh, Scary. Yeah, it's been like that. Everybody's been kind of okay with it, but uh, I'm going to adjust this just slightly so it goes to my steady speed. And, uh, right. I would love that. I'm so happy to have my stabilizer back. I can't put it on in the middle of a live feed um, because I'd have to have you guys... <laughs> it would look terrible while I was doing it. Well, that's a relief. All right, now let's head back and see if we can find some bobcats. Maybe a cute little summer bobcat. Sorry about the wind noise. Duchess still has some of her Big Cat Public Safety Act boxes. We did some enrichment for them recently to celebrate passing the Big Cat Public Safety Act. That's the bill that makes it illegal to pet baby lions and tigers and ligers and cougars and leopards and jaguars. That's now illegal in the United States. And it also phases out private ownership. So people who own these as pets, they can keep the ones they have if they register them by the middle of June with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. If they don't, they'll be seized. But they can register them. They can keep the ones they have. They just can't acquire any more or breed any more. And by registering them, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will know how many they have and how many they should have if they inspect in the future. Where's Mrs. Claus? Is she in the barrel? Are you in the barrel, my missy? She is not. She lives next door to Summer, Bobcat here. So I kind of got distracted. We were talking about the future of the sanctuary. And I know there's been an awful lot of people asking what the future of the sanctuary is. So to address some of the... Hi, Summer. Hello. It's just me, baby cat. Can we see your face? You see her ear? I see an ear. That's all I see. I'd really like to see more than just an ear. Can we look down through here? And maybe through here. <laughs> there she is. She's a youngster and really fast and really grabby. 
So I'm going to talk about the future in a minute. I just need to keep an eye on her. Oh my goodness, such a twitchy tail. That's such a twitchy tail. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So thank you for that little peek at you. Trying to see if I can get a better angle anywhere here. I can get an angle on her tail. You're just too ridiculous. Too ridiculous. So some of the things I'm fairly certain of, as far as the future of Big Cat Rescue goes, people were asking, are we still going to maintain our social media presence? And the answer to that is yes. Big Cat Rescue is not going away. We just will not have cats in cages in Tampa, Florida. We are still going to do the conservation work that we have been doing for many years and there's some really exciting stuff on the forefront there. I just got a report from Dr. Jim Sanderson. He is our guru when it comes to who to support in the wild. He knows all of the good guys and all of the bad guys. He knows who's actually doing the best work with donor money to save these small cat species in the wild. And we think it's important to fund the small cat species because people will give to lions and tigers and cheetahs all day long. But the lesser cats, like marbled cats or palace cats, some people have never even heard of those cats. And so they just don't get much in the way of funding. And $1,000, $5,000 can mean the difference in a program existing or not existing. So we've always given, not always, but for the past many years, we have always given, <laughs> keep putting always in there, for the past many years, we have donated to conservation projects or what is called in situ work. And in recent years, we've donated over $100,000 a year to those small cat species, mostly small cat species. And so by merging all of our cats with the Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge cats, and that way there's only the overhead of one sanctuary instead of two sanctuaries to house all of these cats. We'll continue to fund the vet care and food and everything for our cats when they get there. And we're building $1.8 million worth of bigger cages than what they have here at Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge. But we won't have all of the overhead costs and all of the staffing issues. And so by not having that dupli duplicative effort, the donor's money goes further toward taking care of those cats for the rest of their lives and helping us save cats in the wild. So we are expecting to be able to give, instead of 100 grand a year, closer to 500,000 a year to saving cats in the wild where they belong. And as a result of that, I think people will find that pretty interesting. I know most people tend to like to give to a rescue that makes you feel good, it's exciting, and unfortunately, as soon as the excitement's over, people tend to forget about those cats and want to go rescue some other cat, but I really think if people could see how their donations are being spent in the wild, that they might care about protecting these wildlife species in the wild where they belong, even if you can't go see them in a cage. And so we hope to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Reinvent that whole industry the same way we feel like we reinvented the sanctuary world. Before Big Cat Rescue, you didn't have live webcams all over a sanctuary showing you every single thing going on in a sanctuary for big cats. That was something that we felt people would care about, that they would not care about the, the technical issue of it, but that they would come to love the cats based on being able to see them and know the good and the bad. It's, it's human nature to want everyone to think that things are 
always perfect. And I can assure you that is not the case. There are challenges in running a sanctuary, but by showing you those challenges and letting you become a part of their everyday life, I think it's led us to having the most um, dedicated, well-informed, committed fans in the world. And I want to bring that to Cats in the Wild. So back to Jim Sanderson. This morning I woke up to an email from him on a project that he recommends. And I'm, I'll have to look and see if it's one that we actually fund already or if he was just suggesting that we fund it. I'm looking for Gil again and not seeing him. Um, for marble cats. And he was showing that one of the things that has been very helpful from the money that they have gotten was to put up billboards about how these cats are so amazing and that they are a cultural heritage for everybody to be proud of and they shouldn't be shooting them, eating them, <laughs> um, killing them for killing their chickens. We, a lot of the work that we do is to create systems where people who are farming animals can live next to big cats without wanting to kill them for retribution of them killing a goat or a pig or a chicken. So these um, young people, I think there were six of them, had gone around and put up these signs about protecting these cats. And they said it's made a huge impact on the number of people that are killing the cats. Something so simple like that, it doesn't cost a lot of money, but making sure they have what funds they need to do that is just critical to the survival of these small cat species. I keep seeing rocks in the ferns and thinking, there he is, because he's gray, just like the rocks. He might be in the air conditioning. Wouldn't blame him if he were. Yep, he must be. All right, well, no Gilligan sighting, sorry. They also made a number of signs, uh, like flyers, that are being distributed at the schools. To educate kids as to why they shouldn't kill these animals in the hopes that they will go back and encourage their parents to want to protect these cats. Sometimes that's the only way we can protect the wild cats is by getting to the kids first and then they teach their parents and so that was another aspect of the, that that they were doing and then coming up this summer I'm so excited that Dr. Jim Sanderson has offered to take Jamie and Victor with him to Mongolia to see palace cats in the wild Oh my goodness, I love palace cats. If you don't know what that is, look it up as soon as you get off of this call because it is, they are adorable. They are the little Persian cats of the cat clans. Hi. Good morning. You guys have been working hard. I heard you packed away a whole truckload of meat. We did. <laughs> <laughs> Man, got some guns going on there. Good morning. I'm great. How are you? Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. There's Smalls. Hi. So yesterday and today, I'm told that Smalls is not eating. She's still quite active and playful, but not eating. And she has a seasonal thing where she licks at her back foot. I don't know if it's an allergy or what, but she's been doing that a little bit. It's not, it's not red, but it's just a little wet. 
so Aaron has been speaking with the vet group this morning about what we need to do to nip that in the bud. Jessica said she'd like to do that and she'd prefer to do it. I'm not sure what she was responding to though because I didn't see all of the text above that. But I'm glad it's something you would like to do. Yeah, small as Pat. I've now forgotten where I parked my bike, so we're just walking on foot here. Yeah, she does this like every year. She gets like a little hot spot between her toes and she just fusses with it so much that she won't eat for a few days. And they usually have to put her on something to make her quit itching at it. Hey, Filmo. Sleepy Filmo. <gasps> Frankie Cat. Hi, I can always count on you. Yes, you're always up for being seen. Actually, she was doing that yesterday when Brittany was here, so I don't think it's because she's missing Brittany. Uh, in fact, yesterday was Brittany's last day, but this started before then, so it's something that happens every year. You just going to wait in that lockout in case it's time? You never know. It could be time. Oh, that tail is so twitchy. It's so twitchy. Yes. Thank you for stepping out of that feeding lockout so people don't think that you live in that box. It's always ever hopeful that there's going to be something to eat. That cat would weigh 200 pounds if we let him. Hello. Hi. <gasps> Hello, my sweet boy. Yeah. Let's see if we can study this here. <laughs> it's such a big yawn. Such a very big yawn. I just love those twitchy tails. Deb, you're right. He he just has a very long, kind of like a Greek or a Roman nose. And I see that that has sparked a lot of people asking questions about Brittany. I'm not at liberty to talk about it. And all I can say is that yesterday was her last day. So for all the people who are on here constantly saying, where's Brittany, where's Brittany? You should know that you won't be seeing her here at Big Cat Rescue anymore. And that's all that I'm going to say about it. That's all that the moderators are going to say about it. And I'd really appreciate if all of you guys don't get together and start gossiping about your ideas or anything else about it, because that's between me and Brittany and really not up for discussion by anybody else, especially anybody here at Big Cat Rescue. We have a code of honor and our code of honor number six is if it's not my story, I won't tell it. 
And I think that's a really good story for all of us, or story, it's a really good um, code of honor for all of us to use. If we aren't speculating about what other people are doing or thinking or being or anything else, and we just stick to what we know about ourselves, then I think the world would be a much better place. And there'd probably be no reason for all of these celebrity magazines that are out there. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Did that foot get dirty laying there? You better make sure it gets clean. We don't want dirty feet on this feed. Yeah, now you got it. You got it so nice and clean. Are you going to break the internet with your cuteness now? I thought you were going to start rolling. I love how they just lay and listen to the birds. Victoria is correct. The cages that we're building at Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge in Eureka Springs are bigger than the cages they have here, especially for the tigers. The tigers are getting half acre cages each. That's the smallest one is half acre. And they look amazing, amazing. If you could if you can imagine looking at the vacation rotation enclosure, so that's two acres, two and a half acres. I think it's two and a half acres. Um, if you could imagine that that was eight cages filled that entire space, that's what the tigers are going to have. It'd be like all of our tigers living in vacation rotation. <laughs> Actually, that's not what it would be. Like all of our tigers living in vacation rotation just with fences between them so they can't hurt each other. That's what they're going to have there. And it's up on a mountaintop and they can see for miles and miles and miles. Visually, when you guys see them, it's going to be a lot easier for you to see them if they want to be seen. They'll have places like they'll have dens that we're building and platforms and places that they can hide if they want to. But like I was saying earlier, like an hour ago, if a cat's up here laying against the front end of the cage, like Shiloh is, if you were going on a tour, you would see him. But he could be, can you see that white wall back there? He could be all the way back there where that white wall is. And because of all of the stuff in the way, you wouldn't be able to see him at all. And it wouldn't be that he's trying to get away from you to be back there. It's just he's choosing a different spot in his enclosure. So this way, they should be able to, um, or visitors should be able to see the cats unless the cats don't want to be seen. And it's always going to be their choice because Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge is a accredited sanctuary. It's accredited by the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, which is the gold bar standard. And so as a result, they're always going to put the cat's needs first. And if the cats don't want to be seen, they're not going to be seen. But it won't be just because of where they chose to be in their cage that turned out not to be visible to the public, even though the cat may not have cared, like clearly <laughs> this cat does not care. Oh, you know what I see? I see Moses. It's a rare spiding spot. <laughs> I can't. I'm joining all my words. It's a rare sighting of Moses. I've been trying for days to get a good look at Bailey and she's just loving that little clump of bushes that she sleeps in. All I can see is her tail sticking out of that. But Moses has been every once in a while getting up on this platform here. And I think we're going to end it here with Moses. I'm going to be quiet.
so I didn't want to talk and wake him up. Yeah, he's still asleep. Um, somebody asked if they're still going to get the same medications and flea medications and everything at Turpentine Creek that they get here. Here in Florida, <laughs> we have a whole lot more issues with ticks and fleas. And so we do a, I, I shouldn't say this because I'm not sure. We do a regular, I don't know if it's quarterly or if it's monthly, with Brevecto to take care of the fleas and ticks. And then... Um, I know quarterly we do Panicure, which takes care of a lot of the hook, or not hookworms, but the types of parasites that they get from eating lizards, which are also all over Florida. And so I don't know what their deworming protocol is at Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge, but I can tell you that it would be appropriate for their cats because, like I said, they're accredited. They're not going to be skimping on taking care of the animals. Oh, hi. I was looking under your bush and you were right here, Bailey. Oh, you made your mama's day. Yeah, so happy to see you. Put this up here closer to my mouth so I don't have to talk so loud. So they're going to do whatever is necessary for the environment where they live. I know that they do differently for ticks. They spray their enclosures instead of putting the topicals on the cats. And so they will do that where our cats live. But we also are, in addition, they don't do the Brevecto, I don't think. And it's ghastly expensive. And so what we have worked out with them is that we'll pay for the Brevecto for our cats. And so they'll continue to get that to make sure they don't have fleas or ticks. Deb, I am so happy you posted that link because I've forgotten to say it even once today. <laughs> so if you go to bigcatrescue.org slash moving, it'll tell you everything about the move, why the move is the best option for the cats, why it's the best option for our donors, and why it's necessary for us to do this so that we can save these guys in the wild before it's too late. And so all of that is at bigcatrescue.org slash moving. The part that's not there is about the future. And I keep starting to talk about that. And then I keep getting distracted by these amazing cats. <laughs> She's going to get sick of me and walk away, I know. Um, so we intend to keep our social media up and running because I think people will really enjoy seeing palace cats in the wild. Oh, I can't wait. Um, I know they're going to love seeing the work that the people who are protecting the marbled cats are doing. We have gotten footage from in the wild of people doing collaring. We don't do a whole lot of collaring. Um, collaring is for finding out where cats go so that you can save habitat for them. Most of what we are doing is dealing with known issues. So where cats are currently taking chickens, we're helping people build coops that protect their chickens from the cats so that they don't kill the cats, doing things like that, putting fences around wells so that in the middle of the night when cats are chasing prey, they don't run right into the well and drown. Um, those are the kinds of efforts that we think do the most good for the cats. People are asking if we're going to continue leaving our Facebook channel live our YouTube channel live, and that is our intent. What I may do, because I just don't know how much new footage we'll be able to get from in the wild. Cats are elusive, and it's really hard to get anything that you guys might want to see. And so um, we may work out something with Turpentine Creek where they post their cats. Hi, Bailey. You coming to get a drink? I'll leave you alone while you drink. Um, maybe share the channels with them because we have such a huge presence in social media and we don't want that to just go fallow. And of course, we want you guys who have been following us to continue to have new and interesting things. So we hope to do a lot of that shared work with them. Um, other things for the future, we will continue to be a 501c3. We'll continue to do fundraising to save wild cats in the wild. 
and to take care of our cats. We're committed to providing lifetime care for them. So we're building the cages at Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge and we're providing care for our cats. And so that's stuff that we still need you to help with. If you know and love these cats, we really hope you will continue to donate to us so that we can continue to take care of them there. I'm trying to think if there were any other, maybe Deb can pop any other questions in here about, <laughs> Barbara's like, wow, you're still alive. <laughs> You've been talking all morning, Carol, shut up. <laughs> that's not what she said. Um, but some of you may feel that way by now. Ginger is the one that's on funcation right now. So what I'm going to do is that page at Big Cat Rescue. Oh, she's underneath the platform out there. Again, she's got all these trees. She's got this great concrete den. And what's she do? She's under the platform. So Give Day, just recently, uh, last Tuesday, was our big Give Day. Last I saw, we raised about $76,000 in donations. Plus, I think there was like $40,000 in matching funds. And all of that money was being raised to build platforms and heated dens for our cats when they get to Turpentine Creek. Well, actually, they'll be done before our cats get to Turpentine Creek because they have to be done before our cats go. But that's what we were raising money for. And um, I want to thank everybody who gave during Give Day to make sure that they could have plenty of platforms because you know how much they love them. I hear Beecher over there. All right, I'm going to try and walk and read. If anybody's got any last minute questions. Um, if a Facebook supporter can be used for cats in the wild and rehab, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, so the money that comes in from Facebook, that goes into our general um, donations. And it'll be those donations that we continue to raise and spend in the wild. We're selling the property here because it's too valuable to use it as a sanctuary when it could generate literally millions of dollars for conservation. And so um, that's another of the reasons that you'll find if you go to bigcatrescue.org slash moving that we're doing this. But just because we have millions of dollars from this doesn't mean that your dollar isn't, isn't important. Every dollar we put into saving wildcats in the wild is saving our planet because without those apex predators, the whole ecosystem falls apart. So invest in the future of your children by donating to Big Cat Rescue. Oh, somebody found a very hairy poopy, it sounds like. <laughs> you guys want to see it? <laughs> oh man, this is exciting stuff. <laughs> Not every day we get to see this on a live. Oh, that is furry. Isn't it furry? That's disgusting. Are you sure that's poop and not a mat? No, she hasn't really had mats on her, but she's been licking um, her foot a lot. Uh, two, a couple days ago, I think on Friday, she was licking it a bunch, and now she's missing some fur on that toe, so I think I found the fur. <laughs> we'll make her a new toe. <laughs> Here, you want one? Here, put it back. Actually, her toe is just fine. It's just the fur that's that she's licked off and she does this like every year she gets some kind of irritation where she just fusses and fusses and fusses with it until they figure out the right medications for her but thank you for finding that emma and sharing it this was a fun time i'm sure <laughs> uh Apparently, Victor said the dump cart is fixed. It had some worn out bushings. It was driving really weird yesterday when, well, if you guys were on Singing Sunday, you heard me complaining and complaining and complaining about it. And so first thing this morning, Victor got on it and got it fixed and found my stabilizer. So happy he found that. I had a whole pile of stabilizers, but not one of them was charged. So the one that I use all the time was uh, missing in action until this afternoon, or is it afternoon? It's afternoon now, but it wasn't when I found it, or he found it. Bobcat Rehab, thank you. Um, yeah, so that's another question people are asking is, what are you gonna do about Bobcat Rehab? I don't know. Um, the guy that I had come out here to look at all the trailers, one of the things that he's gonna give me a price on 
is how much would it cost to relocate our Bobcat hospital? I have, in the state of Florida, you have to have five acres to house lions, tigers, big cats. But for the small cats, Bobcats, there is no minimum acreage requirement. And my house is like right at five acres. I have another couple of properties that are like three acres each. And so we're looking at, could we move the Bobcat Rehab Hospital to one of those other locations? I've contacted the people who built those rehab runs, the 4,200 square foot Bobcat runs that are in rehab. We have six of those and they cost us 60,000 a piece to build them. And it's gonna cost $57,000 a piece to tear them down. And then probably <laughs> that much to put them back up. So we're looking at where could we relocate those two that would be, that would make more sense um, on a property that's not worth as much as this property is to be able to generate the funds we need for saving cats in the wild. We were hoping to work with the Bush Wildlife um, Sanctuary down in Jupiter, Florida, because they're moving, but they said that they were not allowed to use any used materials, and so we weren't able to donate them there. We are still looking around to see if there's anybody that is doing Bobcat Rehab or who wants to do Bobcat Rehab that has a history of doing Rehab Bright that we could partner with to set up there for them and then um, share the facility. So there's lots and lots of things going on with Bobcat Rehab. We just don't know quite yet what we're going to do. I did talk to Scott and Tanya about whether or not Bob, uh, rehab work in general is necessary in Eureka Springs, and they have lost their only rehabber there, not at their facility, but there was a rehabber near Eureka Springs in Berryville, I think. And so they, there's not currently a rehabber in that area. And so maybe they would want to start doing rehab and we could uh, relocate the cages there. I just, I don't know. But I know that is a big concern because Florida bobcats still need protecting and there's just not a lot of good options for them and so we want to continue to do that work. Jamie really loves doing that kind of work and I want her to be able to do the work that she loves and for people to benefit from her many decades of experience. I just don't know yet what that's going to be. So as soon as I know, I will let you guys know. But meanwhile, on the things that I do know or think I know, I'm going to go ahead and update bigcatrescue.org slash moving with an area maybe down at the very bottom that says predict the future for me, <laughs> which is what people are wanting me to do. Um, and I will do my best to predict what I think is out there. And maybe if we all picture that positively in our minds, like we were talking about at the first part of this, we will be able to bring that into fruition. Love you guys. Thank you for joining me on this very long walkabout. And I'm going to give my voice a rest and maybe come back and answer some more questions here if I see that there were any that were missed, which I doubt because Deb's amazing. I don't know if Luana's here right now, but I haven't seen. But I know that you've got lots of people here in the comments that know a lot about what's going on and can't answer your questions. Thank you so much. Mwah!